if our families have any hope, people must know Jesus. This is what we must experience. The time is coming on this earth where you will have to stand. Days of our probation are fast closing. The end is near. To us, the warning is given. Take heed to yourself. Father in heaven, we thank you for another privilege of making it safely into your house to study your holy word. We are very aware that the wages of sin is death, and we are aware, uh, we are aware that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we want to thank you for the obvious mercy that allows us to be in your presence now. Please forgive us for our sins, the sin of neglect, Lord. We ask that you would deepen our appreciation for spiritual things, deepen our understanding in your word. In the name of Jesus, we command that every unclean spirit leave this sanctuary. Dear Lord, we pray that you would bind them and allow this atmosphere to be holy and this atmosphere to be completely known by your presence and your presence alone. Pour out not only your spirit, but dispatch holy angels to worship with us. Make your word clear. Control not only the atmosphere, but even the boundaries around this church. May people who pass by feel quickened by a presence and momentarily think of their own eternal salvation. Please help us, Lord. Help your minister be with his mind so that it would stay paralyzed so the mind of Christ can operate and teach us. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen, amen. For those of you who were privileged to be here this past Wednesday night, if you remember, the subject was total recall. And there was a portion that wasn't clear as we were reading it together. And I said that I would give you the edited version tonight and you know, it was amazing this afternoon as I was prostrate before God talking to him and he reminded me to give you this and I opened up the computer and I started searching the book. It was amazing what part was left out. And if you just look at that paper a minute, this is not our subject tonight. <clears throat> But the part that was left out was at the second chapter, the second paragraph. Father, we plead for your presence. Help us to appreciate it more so that one day we can live in an atmosphere where we won't have to pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit, for we will always be with him. Forgive us for pushing you off. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, 
I'm just going to begin with the first paragraph. As they come forth from their graves, they resume the current of their thoughts where it ceased in death. And if you remember, if you remember, we talked about when a person dies, what happens when a person dies. And we said that when a person dies, they go to the grave. They do not go to heaven. And we even said that there are texts in the Bible that people like to quote that appear that it might be suggesting that one goes to heaven. Like, for instance, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I'll give you a handout on that Monday night to show you that that's not talking about someone going directly to heaven. And if you remember, we went to Matthew 27. Let's look at that a moment and review. It's very important because tonight we want to put a final piece into the picture. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. And if you remember, brothers and sisters, if you remember, we said that when one scripture seems to suggest something that would cancel out 30 or 40 scriptures, then our interpretation of that scripture has to be wrong. And we also showed various illustrations, and we said that whenever you find yourself in a theological uh, I don't like to use the word debate, but if you find yourself in a theological uh, um, um, conversation and people are sincere in heart because people believe differently and you might say, well, I believe that this happens. And somebody say, yeah, but look at what the Bible says here. And somebody else says, well, no, look here. And then you start challenging one another or sharing scriptures. Remember, whenever there's conflict, Jesus is the conflict solver. Wherever there's difficulty, Jesus can remove the difficulty. Wherever there's confusion, there's no confusion with Jesus. So whenever you have a doctrinal problem that you cannot solve, go to the life of Christ. Every principle in the Bible is taught and seen in the life of Christ. And when we look here in Matthew 27, dealing with the life of Christ, notice what the Bible says, beginning with verse 46 and about the ninth hour. Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. And straight away one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. At that time, there was not one human alive capable of preaching with understanding and authority the Word of God. And because God has always had a preacher, a representative on earth in his absence, God allowed something to take place. Listen to what it says in verse 52. The, in verse 51, the Bible says, After Jesus gives up the ghost, after Jesus cries, it is finished. And behold, the veil of the temple was written twain from top to bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints, which what? Slept, arose. And they came out. And they started preaching Christ all throughout the earth. Jesus will always have somebody that will represent him. Now, if they died and went straight to heaven, then why were they coming out of the graves? In the life of Christ, we can trust it. In John chapter 11, it is very clear. When the message came to Jesus, Jesus, Lazarus, thy friend, not only thy friend, but thy friend that you love is sick. He's sick, Lord. Jesus sat down for two more days. Finally, he stands and he said, let's go. Lazarus is sleep. They thought that he was talking about regular sleep. He was talking about the sleep of death. And he said, I must go so that I can awake him. Why? Because I am the resurrection, Jesus said. I am the very embodiment of life. Without me, there is no existence. And when he got there, he said, roll back the stone. As a matter of fact, the shortest text in the Bible is Jesus wept. And he wept because of the ignorance of the people who were supposed to believe in him. Here they are crying and weeping with the power of the resurrection walking next to them. And it caused them to weep because all of his teaching. All of his explaining, they still just didn't get it. 
And Jesus said, roll back the stone. And when they rolled back the stone, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus had accustomed himself to knowing the voice of God prior to dying. And as a result, he came forth. He didn't come out of heaven. Certainly one of Jesus' best friends, someone who Jesus loved as a companion on earth, should have gone to heaven when he died. And if he had gone to heaven, Lazarus wouldn't have wanted to come back from heaven here. Not to mention when the Bible says very clearly, when Mary in John 21 went to touch Jesus, Jesus said to her, let me make sure, I think it might be John chapter 20. Notice what the Bible says. I don't want to make anything up. I want to give you God's word, not man's word, because you can't argue with God's word. So I don't care what any other passage of the Bible may suggest. When we look at the life of Christ, it pretty much settles it, doesn't it? Notice what it says here in John chapter 20. John chapter 20, that was right. John chapter 20, the Bible says very clearly, beginning with verse 11, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Why didn't she know it was him? Did he look different? No. But her eyes were so filled with tears, they were so clogged with water, she really couldn't tell. But when she heard his voice, she was familiar with it, and she ran to him, Rabboni. He said, don't touch me, Mary. I have not yet ascended to my father. I haven't gone to heaven. I was in the grave. Listen to what it says here. And when she had thus said, she turned herself and saw Jesus standing and knew not it, that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But I go, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my father and your father and to my God and to your God. I am going right now, but I haven't gone yet, so don't touch me. But after he left, when he came back, then he was able to say, Philip, I mean, or Thomas. Go on and put your, put your hand through the hose. It's really me. Touch me and feel me. And he said, you know what, Thomas? Because you are able to see me and feel me, you believe. But blessed are those who are unable to see me and unable to feel me and believe on my word anyway. He was talking about us, brothers and sisters. And so the Bible clearly teaches that right now, existing among us are the living Righteous and the wicked living. Also, we have the dead, righteous, or in Christ, and we have the dead, wicked. And we have the dead, wicked. Now, we learned the other night that when a man dies, he goes to the grave. Then we learned that after that, when Jesus comes, remember the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning with verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those who are alive in Christ, they are caught up with those who died, and they go with the Lord to heaven. We learned that at the same time, it was clear that the wicked, according to 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, are slain with the brightness of his coming. It's a horrible thing. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 25 that they're slain from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. Revelation 19, 21 says that the birds eat their flesh. And that we are told that the wicked are slain and on this earth for 1,000 years dead. We are also told 
that the devil is left here with no one to frustrate for 1,000 years. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 that this is the first resurrection. And then it gives a criteria. He says, blessed and holy are they that have part in the first resurrection. In other words, if you are not holy, you will not rise in the first resurrection. Only those who are holy, only those who are pure, only those who have surrendered everything will rise in the first resurrection to be saved. And if you come up in the second resurrection, the Bible says you will experience the second death. And this is what we were reading about. We were talking about when the wicked would be resurrected. And we're going to talk about that a little more from the Bible, but I just want to show you this mistake before we go forward. This is what this is talking about. It says, as they come forth from their graves, talking about the wicked, they resume the current of their thoughts where it ceased in death. If they had hip-hop on their mind, that music kicked on just like hitting the pause button. And you could hit the pause button in my car, and not only would it continue when you unpause it, but it will back up a few seconds and go forward so you remember exactly what was on. Whatever's on your mind is going to be what you wake up to. And this is why we must learn to educate and train the mind and our imagination, as we talked about earlier today, to keep our eyes focused on Christ and heavenly things so that no matter what should happen to us, if we should die, when we come back up, the current of our thoughts will be Christ, and that's who we'll be looking at. Notice what it says here. They possess the same desire to conquer, which rude, rude when, when they fail. Satan consults with his angels and then with those kings and conquerors and mighty men. Then he looks over the vast army and tells them that the company in the city is small and feeble and that they can go up and take it and cast out its inhabitants and possess its riches and glory themselves. Satan succeeds in deceiving them and all immediately begin to prepare themselves for battle. There are many skillful men in that vast army, and they construct all kinds of implements of war. Then with Satan at their head, the multitude move on. Kings and warriors follow close after Satan, and the multitude follow after in companies. Each company has its leader, and order is observed as they march over the broken surface of the earth to the holy city. Jesus closes the gates of the city. And place themselves and place themselves in, 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 in battle array, expecting a fierce conflict. Now Christ again appears to the view of his enemies. Far above the city, upon a foundation of varnished gold, is a throne, high and lifted up. Upon this throne sits the Son of God, and around him are the subjects of his kingdom. And this is the part that was left out. The power and majesty of Christ no language can describe, no pen portray. The glory of the eternal Father is enshrouding the Son. The brightness of his presence fills the city of God and flows out beyond the gates, flooding the whole earth with its radiance. In the presence of the assembled inhabitants of the earth and heaven take place, the final coronation of the Son of God. Brothers and sisters, this is going to be an event that everybody's going to see. Believe it or not, it's going to take place. You can read the rest of that over when you get home. It's going to take place no matter what you believe. Now, the big problem is this. People die. They go to the grave. At the resurrection, we are told very clearly, and by the way, we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but tapes are available of each subject. And you need to study, brothers and sisters, to show thyself approved. At the resurrection, the righteous come up. The dead in Christ, they rise first. Those who are alive in Christ are caught up with them, according to the Bible. We get immortal bodies. Behold, I show you a mystery. We should not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, God's going to change us. But at the same time, the wicked remain. Some people say that people are, go straight to heaven, and others say that the wicked are burning even now in hell. Brothers and sisters, nothing could be further from the truth. What type of God? would allow a man who lives a rebellious life for 21 years in 1612 to die and be burning from 1612 even to now. 
What type of God could that be? As cruel as man is, even man's punishments aren't that cruel. What kind of God would take someone and allow them to suffer forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? What kind of God do you think we serve? That's contrary to biblical teaching. And tonight I'm going to show you that. First of all, turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. The Bible is clear. Do you know how many people have given up on the whole concept of God? The whole concept of believing in Jesus have literally turned. Those who worship the devil are taught that God is a God of vengeance, a God of hate, a God that loves to see people suffer, and then they point to scriptures that suggest that one might burn eternally. And I want to explain that and let the Bible be its own interpreter. Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 13, and notice what the Bible says. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, but we ask that more of your presence will come into this room as we deal with this very deceptive subject where the devil has lied to many and turned many away we beg you to make it clear in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in verse 24 of Matthew 13, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And notice, the disciples didn't quite understand. They wondered, what was this parable about? Wheat, tares, enemy sowing seed, good seed, bad seed, bundle them. What are they talking about? So the Bible says in verse 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. In other words, explain what you meant, Lord. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is what? Is what? Is the world. The good seed are what? The children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sold them is who? The devil. The harvest is when? The end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be when? In the end of this world. The fire begins at the end of this world. That's clear. Now wait a minute. That's why Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, in 2 Peter chapter 2, notice what Peter says. Jesus said, no, wait until the end of the world. Nobody's burning right now, and this is going to be even clearer as we go forward. 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, and when you get there, let me hear you say amen. 2 Peter chapter 2, you see, brothers and sisters, we serve a God that is not only a loving God, but He's a consistent God. He's a consistent God. And He died that we might have life. He's not sitting around. God could not stand to sit and watch somebody be burning right now. At the end of the world is the harvest. Is the, is the world over? No. It doesn't even say when He comes. He says at the end of the world. Now notice what it says here in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible says very clearly, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be what? To be punished. God knows how to reserve them unto the day of judgment. There are two distinct resurrections. There's a resurrection of the righteous and there's a resurrection of the wicked. Go with me to Revelation chapter 20. Let's just look at that again. 
There are two resurrections. There's a resurrection of the righteous. There's a resurrection of the wicked. Revelation, what chapter are we going to? Revelation chapter 20. And notice what the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 20. And brothers and sisters, you need to write these things down so that when people have been deceived by the lies of Satan, and you need to understand that some people who teach this, they don't mean to be deceptive. Some of them are just doing the best they can because they've taken one text and they've isolated it. This is why the Bible says that we are to study all the scriptures. This is why we need to read the whole book so that we know everything that God has to say. Because the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So if God gives us all scripture, why wouldn't we want to read it all? Many of us have lived long enough to read this book over and over and over and have never read it once. But brothers and sisters, we must learn the truth as it is in Jesus. For the devil knows well that all whom he can gain to neglect prayer and the searching of scriptures shall be overcome by his attacks. If you're not studying, you're not going to make it. Mama's prayers can only keep you so long. You must reach out for yourself if you plan to make it. And brothers and sisters, there's a fierce war going on right now. It is more vicious than it's ever been because the devil knows that he has a short time. He knows that Jesus is about to come. He has studied prophecy and it's nothing he can do about it except one thing. And that's he does his very best to keep you so occupied so that you're unprepared. Have mercy on us, Lord. Revelation 20, the Bible says in verse 6, matter of fact, verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the what? First resurrection. Now, if that text says this is the first resurrection, then there must be another one. Or why would God make a distinction? This is the first resurrection. Who goes in the first resurrection? The righteous. The wicked, according to the Bible, stay right here for 1,000 years. That's what it says. And notice what it goes on to say. It says, blessed and holy. No blessings without holiness. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the second resurrection. Amen? Is that what it says? And no, in the first resurrection. So these people that start teaching about this secret rapture, and some people are going to be resurrection and raptured away, and others are going to live according to my Bible right here. The blessing comes for those who are part of the first resurrection. The Bible does not teach that there's another time that Christ is coming. And if you could find it, you write it down, and I'll preach it Monday night. Go through your Bible and find it. Oh, look, here it is. It's not there. It's not there. When the Bible says in Luke 17, the one shall be taken and the other left. The one shall be taken and the other left. It ends by saying, where, Lord, where will they be left? And Jesus says, wheresoever the eagles be gathered together, thither also will be the body. In other words, they will be left on this earth. Jeremiah saw it in Jeremiah 25 very clearly, beginning with verse 31. Jeremiah saw it. He said that they were slain from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. He said they were not buried, nor did anybody cry over them because there was no one here to cry. There was no one here to bury them. Why? Because the wicked were dead and the righteous were gone to heaven, brothers and sisters. And the Bible says, blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection. Well, Jesus even talked about the two resurrections. Go with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And notice what the Bible says. I'm so thankful for the Word of God. The Word of God settles it, brothers and sisters. Notice what it says in John chapter 5. Listen to what the Bible says in John chapter 5. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says, beginning with verse 28, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall what? Shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Two separate resurrections. Daniel talked about it in Daniel chapter 12. Back up in your Bibles to the great book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. That prophet was amazing. Notice what the Lord showed him. And the Lord showed Daniel a time that many of you will be alive on this earth when things take place. 
Some of us will be alive when the final fulfillment of the book of Daniel for, uh, uh, takes place. Even now, we're living in the final verses of Daniel chapter 11. I can't wait until we start getting into the prophecies, but I want to lay a foundation first. Brothers and sisters, line upon line, precept upon precept, we must not only hear the word, we must learn the word. We must be able to articulate the word because God needs you desperately. Why? Because he promised. Jesus promised this. He said, in this gospel of the kingdom, a particular gospel, all the truth must be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Well, God doesn't have enough people teaching or preaching this. The devil's trying to shut man's mouth or confuse his mind because he recognizes until all the truth is taught to the whole world, Jesus can't come. So the devil tells all his, his generals and all his, 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 his majors and all his military might, we must stop the gospel from being preached. Oh, let them preach Jesus' love. Oh, let them preach that all they want. But don't allow all the gospel to be preached. Seal up some of it. Shut their minds from it. Blind them. Deceive them. For when this particular message goes to the world, the end will come. And brothers and sisters, it's getting ready to go. It's going even now in a blaze of glory. It may appear that the devil's winning, but you're about to see a fierce war. Satan and Christ in a final conflict. And righteousness is going to prevail. And it will prevail in some of you if you surrender to God. If you learn his word, but if you don't know his word, what, can he, what, what good are you for him? When he needs you to open your mouth for him, if you don't know what to say, then what on earth would he count on you for? That's like going to someone who doesn't know any type of math and asking them to help you with your geometry. What good are they if they don't know it? You want to go to someone who knows geometry and has gone beyond. The Holy Spirit is our great teacher. He's willing to sit with any of us, not only to bring us comfort and power, but to teach us all things and to bring these things back to our remembrance at the time we need them. Jesus is counting on you, brothers and sisters. Let's look at what the great prophet Daniel says in Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12, beginning with verse 1, and at that time shall Michael stand up. This is, brothers and sisters, right at the end, and, and I wish I could go into 11 to explain what he means by this. But he says, at that time, M Michael shall stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall what? Be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to what? Everlasting life. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. Two resurrections. Now where is hell? If it's not burning now, where is it? Some people have been taught and they believe that the devil is limited somewhere under the earth where it's real hot and he's down there just frustrated. No, brothers and sisters. The devil is walking to and fro in the earth seeking whom he may devour. He's not inactive. He doesn't take a break. He doesn't rest. He doesn't rest at all. He ignores even the day of rest that God commanded should be kept and remembered. The devil is vigorously at work, and he's constantly trying to study new methods in order to gain man and hold him captive. So where is this hell? The Bible says that hell fire will be right here on this earth. Go with me to 2 Peter again. Notice what the Bible says. Oh, God, pour out more of your spirit. Please, Lord. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 tells us where exactly hell will be. 2 Peter chapter 3. Notice what the Bible says. It's clear. The Bible has all the answers. Sometimes we may not see them right away, but they're there. God left us his word so that there's no question. So we don't have to be deceived. So that we can know the truth. Notice what it says here in 2 Peter chapter 3. And if you're there, let me hear you say amen. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And then it says, For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old, 
and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. It's talking about the flood. It says, hey, people scoffed when the flood came. Where's the rain, Noah? Especially when that door of that ark shut. Can you imagine? They were taunting and teasing, laughing and joking. Where's the rain, Noah? You preached that it was going to rain. Ah, look at you now. You and your children and your children-in-law, they are crazy to be in there with you, Noah. But guess what? When they heard the thunderous sound bolting through the air and clouds coming together and clasping and clashing, all of a sudden it wasn't funny anymore, was it? You see, when people come to you, and I had somebody just tell me a week ago. They said, brother, you know what? My grandfather was said in his day, Jesus is coming. Gee, how, how do I know? This text says they're fulfilling prophecy. It said in the last day, people will ask that question. They say, oh, nothing has happened yet. But God said the same way the water covered the earth the first time, God won't destroy it with water. God made a promise. He said, I will not destroy the earth ever again with water. I'm going to place my bow in the sky. That's why every time it rains, there's a rainbow. It's a sign of God's continual grace. It's a sign of his mercy. He said, I'm going to place the bow in the sky. He gave a promise, and to this day, it still takes place. The second time, he said, it will be fire. Fire is going to destroy the earth. Listen to what it says here. Notice what it says. The Bible says, whereby, in verse 6, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved under what? Fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. In other words, this earth is being preserved for the fire. Hell, fire will be right here. Verse 10 says it. Listen to what it says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now listen, that's not talking about he's going to sneak up. See, the righteous, it's not going to be a thief to them. 1 Thessalonians 5 is clear. It says, but to you, brothers, it doesn't come as a thief. Why? Because you're watching. You have your eyes on me. It's not going to be a surprise to you. But the wicked who think life is going to just continue to go on and on and on as it is, it's going to come as a thief to them. Notice what it says here. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with what? Fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. This earth is going to be on fire. Now, some people say, well, you know what? The fire's going to burn forever and ever and ever. And so that means that someone who dies at 40 years old can burn for 50,000 or 2 million years. Come on. That doesn't even sound right to you. What kind of God would be that way? You see, first of all, one of my favorite texts, or one of a, a text that many of you know, and you probably can quote it with me. Everybody used to quote it. You don't hear it as often. But John 3.16 Come on, quote it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? An everlasting life. In other words, he says that those who love and choose God will have everlasting life. If you're burning forever and ever and ever in a fire, you have everlasting life. It's just in a fire. God said, no, only those who choose me will have everlasting life. As a matter of fact, notice what it says in 1 John. Back up, go, go to 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> you're, in, you're in Peter, but notice what 1 John chapter 3 says. It's very clear. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, go forward in your Bibles from Peter. And when you get there, let me hear you say amen. 1 John chapter 3, the Bible says very clearly, in 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 15. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says, whosoever, are we there? Whosoever hateth his brother is a what? A murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 
If you're in a fire and you're burning forever and ever and ever, that's eternal life. You just have eternal life in a fire. Murderers who do not confess, who are not covered by the blood-stained banner of Jesus, who, re- who will not repent and will not receive forgiveness, those murderers, the Bible says, do not have eternal life in them. It's clear. Let me give you another example. Go forward to the book of Jude, just before the book of Revelation. The book of Jude, just before the book of Revelation. Notice this example here that God gives us. The Bible is replete with scriptures that show the love of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 28 that when God has to finally burn and destroy the sinners with sin, he calls it a strange work, a strange act, a strange work, a strange act. Isn't that something? A strange work. A strange act. It's difficult for God. This is labor for God that he never wants to perform. This is not something that God wants to do. God says, I have no pleasure at all in the death of the wicked. I will find no joy out of it. My pleasure comes from those who turn to me and allow me to save them. God doesn't want to see us burn. Notice what the Bible says in Jude. Zero in on verse 7 with me. The Bible says in Jude, beginning with verse 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal fire. Now what God means is, if I take and I set this on fire, and I burn it, and then finally I hold it until it burns, it's burned eternally. That's what it means. It's eternally burnt. Not that it will burn eternally. It will not burn for on and on and on. Now here's Sodom and Gomorrah. First of all, I'd hate to be a part of that. I mean, here they decided to live rebellious lives in the sight of God. And brothers and sisters, the city was not destroyed because of the sick homosexual acts that were going on. It was not destroyed because men started wanting to marry men and women with women. It was destroyed because the people who knew better, the people who knew better started being quiet about it and going along with it. Oh, a person's just born like that. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. I do believe that people are born with genetic tendencies toward homosexuality. But that does not excuse the sin because God can give you the victory over hereditary and cultivated sins, whatever they are. There are certain people with a disposition to be alcoholics because they received it through their genes. Liars through their genes. Cheats through their genes. Anger through the genes. But no matter what you receive through those genes, God can give you the victory if you surrender to him. Sin is sin. And we can never excuse sin. We must always know that if sin could be excused, Jesus didn't have to die. And he didn't just die. He suffered a bitter death. He suffered a bitter life for you and for me that we might have this victory, that we might have this freedom, that we might have this eternal life abiding in Christ, living with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in an atmosphere of love and peace without restraint because we have developed His character in us by choice. We have allowed him to work in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. So it's not strange when we get to heaven. We're not being trained on how to carry ourselves. We surrender now and God develops it now. It is now right here that we must fit ourselves for the heavenly courts above. There's no no future time where we can develop these characters, brothers and sisters. So here God says, that Sodom and Gomorrah was an example, suffering the eternal fire. Now notice what it says. Remember, go with me to 2 Peter again. Just back up to 2 Peter and notice what it says about Sodom and Gomorrah in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says that Sodom and Gomorrah, it was an example. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. It says it's an example for those who want to play around with sin the way they did. 
suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And 2 Peter chapter 2, listen to what it says, beginning with verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved under judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into what? Ashes condemned them with an overflow, making them an ensample unto those that, should, that after should live ungodly. God says he turned them into what? Ashes. What happens when a fire is all burnt up? It's turned into ashes, brothers and sisters. When the Bible uses the phrase forever, it's talking about as long as there is life. Go with me to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Let me give you a few more texts before I let you go home. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. And I'm even going to do better than that as you're going to 1 Samuel tonight as you leave. I have a whole study I'm going to give you with a whole, uh, 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 a whole section of other texts that I'm not giving you tonight that you could study to validate and support the truth of God's Word. I'm not trying to hide anything from you, brothers and sisters. But if you don't study it, woe be unto you. Woe be unto you if you take these things and you decide, oh, I know it. You must study it. I don't care how many times you hear it. The way you learn it, is first of all, you study it, and secondly, you teach somebody else. And you have to keep doing it because the devil knows Scripture. And if you don't keep repeating these truths and you don't keep studying these truths, listen, I don't just pop up and say, okay, I'm ready to preach this subject. I beg God and plead and agonize and wrestle with Scripture as though I've never taught it before in my life. Because I understand that when you're dealing with sacred things, there's a spiritual element that comes in. And there's an unnatural, unholy, de de uh, a demonic element that will come in. And it will cause your mind to where you can't even think. We can't whoop the devil. We can't teach unless God protects my mouth and mind. Right now, you are seeing before you a miracle that a human being, can articulate the Word of God with authority and great power by the power and authority of God. It's a miracle because if the devil had his way, first of all, you wouldn't be here. And secondly, he would cause such confusion and riotousness in this room that nobody would hear anything but look at the presence of the Holy Spirit. There's a solemnity that could be touched because when God comes in, he answers our prayers. He binds the unclean forces. He moves them out even when some of you didn't ask him to do it. When some of you came in this room with known and presumptuous sins. Some having sins planned for later tonight. God in his mercy so that you will be left excuseless. Move them back so that you could hear the word of truth and make a decision to allow, to allow God to change you this night. You don't have to wait this night. God will do a work on you so that he does not have to perform this strange act. He doesn't want to do it, brothers and sisters. He definitely doesn't want to do it. Notice what it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Heavenly Father, as we begin to close this message, I beg you for greater authority in this room. Thank you for being here. But give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1, speaking of Hannah, dealing with Samuel, what a God-fearing woman she was. What a God-fearing woman. The Bible has more to say about her godliness than her husband. Hannah was something else. Listen to what it says in verse 22. But Hannah went not up. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide how long? forever. Now notice what it says in verse 28. Therefore also, verse 28, therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he what? Liveth. He shall be lent to the Lord. The Bible says as long as he lives, he shall be lent to the world, to the, to the Lord. Forever simply meant as long as he would live. In other words, again, if I light this on fire, brothers and sisters, and I burn it, and I keep burning it, and then I burn it all the way up. Remember what the Bible said when we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, where it says that the earth is going to be on fire? 
and the elements are going to be burned up. When something is burned up, that means the fire ceases. If I burn this up, it's burnt forever. God is not going to have somebody burning for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. You will burn for your sins. It will be a painful and excruciating experience. It is something that you must fight and beg God to be a part of. It is not easy to be lost. It's hard to be lost. It is difficult. The Bible says it's hard to kick against the pricks. It's hard to go against God. But brothers and sisters, some of us are going to refuse. Refuse to the point where there's nothing more God can do. But the time will come when the books are open. When Christ will reveal to you your life just as it was. Nothing edited. It's going to be clear cut. You will see how God pleaded and begged and pleaded and begged. And then right along next to the pleadings of God, you will see the frivolous, foolish, stupid sins that you hung on to. Just did, And you'll look at them with disgust, but it's too late. Disgust, a moment of pleasure to forfeit eternity. The worst part. The worst part of the destruction will not be the fire. It will be eternal separation from God. Looking into the face of your Redeemer. When the wicked see Jesus. See, first of all, no man can look at him now and live. But God is going to create a situation where man's presence in its sinful state, in its rebellious state, can see the glory and the holiness of God. And when they see the lovely face of Jesus, when they see him in his radiance and his glory, when they see him face to face, there is nothing else that they'll desire. And they will know that it is forever too late. They will know that they have forfeited eternal life with a loving creator to hang on to some trifling sin. Oh, brothers and sisters, God loves you. God could not stand to see any of us burn forever and ever and ever. The Lord in his love for me, if I'm not faithful in the end, if I find myself lost, I know him so well that I know it'll break his heart. I know that Christ will weep because I'm lost. He's going to shield us from it. He's not going to allow us to experience the pain. But God is an omniscient God. Omniscience means all-knowing. God will never Forget the children who he died to save when they rebel and refuse to experience eternal life. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says very clearly that we should hold fast to that which we have, that no man take our crown. Your crown can be taken while you're playing games with God, while you're waiting around. Somebody else can make a decision and the number of God be made up. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The Lord cometh in the valley of decision. While you're still thinking, what are you thinking about? What are you deciding on? If God be God, choose him this day. What are we waiting around for? If he's who we claim he is, what is there to think about? And someone else makes a decision while you're still trifling and playing around with sin. Oh, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. God doesn't want to see us burn forever. He doesn't want to see us burn at all. As a matter of fact, let me give you these last texts. Revelation chapter 21. <clears throat> Revelation 21. Notice what the Bible says. Now, Revelation 20 gave the picture. Revelation 19 shows the coming of Christ. Revelation 20 shows Satan bound on this earth for 1,000 years. It says, blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. Then Revelation 20 shows what happens when the wicked are raised up. How they try to take what God begged them to have. They're going to try to take the city of God. Look at them. They're few. We outnumber them. We can take them. People are going to marshal themselves behind the banner of Satan 
And you might think, you might say, well, you know, that's pretty. That's, that, 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 that's, that's, that's not too intelligent at all. As a matter of fact, that's kind of dumb. I can't believe they would do that. But they have trained their mind to follow Satan. Some of us sin without restraint. Some of us, when we identify ourselves on the devil's ground, we go deeper into it rather than retreating. The minute we find ourselves outside of Christ, we should flee back to Jesus. The minute we see that we have separated ourselves from him, I don't care who's watching, I don't care what you have to do, you should get back connected with God. Because in a moment that you think not, your life can be taken. In a moment that you think not, and brothers and sisters, I've, I've lived long enough, even though it's not that long, to have met, witnessed, and seen many people die who weren't planning to die. People who had round-trip tickets. I've been at, at seminars for pastors, and all of a sudden they say, we need to pray for pastor so-and-so's family. What happened? Oh, the pastor had a heart attack and died today. He had a round-trip ticket. He wasn't preparing to die. He is preparing to live. People leave home every day preparing to come back home. And they get into car accidents without a moment's warning. They die. We just don't know. We live in vulnerable times. But God says if you're on his side, you don't have to worry about death. It's just a moment of sleep. You rest in the grave. You're oblivious to anything around you. Job 7 verse 9 says you don't go back to your home, you don't have a memory. You're there, you sleep, and you're waiting for the voice that you have learned, the voice that has become familiar to you, the voice of Jesus Christ. You're waiting for him to cry. Can you imagine his voice piercing through the harsh, hard depths of the earth and your ear after it has already turned back into dust? Worms have eaten this old body, and yet somewhere there's an ear. And that ear hears the sound of Jesus. And your angel rejoices to see you come up. And your angel now points you to the Savior. Oh, brothers and sisters, it's going to be a great day. It's not going to be any secret. The whole world is going to observe the coming of the Lord. My Bible says, every eye shall see. Every eye. There's going to be a special resurrection for those who pierced him. They're going to get to come up, die again, and come back up and burn. Because the Bible says in Revelation 1 verse 7 that every eye will see him, even those that pierce him. Now, brothers and sisters, let me tell you, I don't want to pay attention to those who pierced him. I want to be a part of that first resurrection. And this is what God says. Notice what it says here in Revelation 21. Revelation 21. And I saw, thank you, Lord. I want to begin with verse 19, chapter, chapter 20, I mean. Chapter 20, verse 9. And I'm going to read straight into 21. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. This is the wicked who were lost. Now remember, we just spent a thousand years with Jesus in heaven. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be terminated day and night. How long? Forever and ever, or as long as they shall live. And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up, their dead, gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. That word hell, it, it means in the original grave. That's all it means. It doesn't mean a place of burning. We found tonight that hell fire will be this earth. Amen. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life 
was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are what? Passed away. If someone is burning in a fire forever and ever, there'd still be sorrow. If someone's burning forever and ever, there'd still be pain. No, the fire's going to go out. The earth is going to land. The Bible says that the earth is going to land, the new earth is going to land on ashes. The ashes are going to be there. Satan's going to outburn everybody. When you get home, you read that paper you have. Satan's go, Sa Satan is going to outburn everybody, brothers and sisters. He's, he's going to burn for every sin. He's going to outburn everybody. You read it. It's going to give strict details of what's going to transpire. But behold, tonight, the tabernacle of God is with men. He can't reveal himself the way he wants to, the way he desires. Jesus longs to one day physically put his arms around you. He longs to one day physically explain to you every single concern that you ever had. As a matter of fact, the time will come when you are with Christ and as you are with Him, He's not going to hide anything. Everything that ever perplexed you, He's going to bring back to your memory. Everything so that you will have a clear understanding of all His ways and all of His instructions. And when you see what God has for you and you understand why He took you through the way, that he allowed you to go. Now listen, God never intended for me to smoke crack. I deviated from the plan that God had for my life. In his mercy, in his mercy, because I say mercy because I've sat in the room with people hitting crack and watched them as they took the hit drop because their heart stopped. In his mercy, he allowed me to live. In his mercy, he gave another route, and in his mercy, he allowed my eyes to see and to walk in that way so that tonight I could be here. In his mercy, God never intended for me to drink Old English 800 and, and Mad Dog 2020 and all that other cheap stuff, nor the stuff that costs money, Hennessy and, and Kavasi and the other foolishness that the world tries to glorify. God never intended for me to put that in my mind so it would eat brain cells and weaken my ability to fight the good fight of faith. God never intended that. But in his mercy, he rerouted things, redirected, orchestrated the affairs of men where I would not perish. I thank God because many people did not get so messed up and so distorted with drugs and get in their car and drive and wake up the next morning and wonder, how did I make it home? I know how I made it now. Jesus allowed angels to drive. Some died in their state of drunkenness. I was just called not long ago about a certain person, and I won't say where, I won't say when, because these tapes go all over the world. And this certain person said, oh, my father was killed in a terrible car accident last night. He didn't come home. The police beat on the door. I talked to that man. We had a long talk. He was the only person I talked to after I finished preaching. And I came home. And when I got home, and I got that call months later, it wasn't right away. And I said, oh, Lord, God knows. But when they found his alcohol level, brothers and sisters, he was drunk. He was so drunk, he should have never been driving. When we put those things to our mouth, everything that we do goes down in the judgment as though we were sober. Nobody forced you to take that drink. God, in his mercy, became humble enough to be a chauffeur and chauffeured me home on countless nights because he knew that in my heart I wanted to be saved. He knew it, but God, when he even shows me the way he redirected things 
and I wondered why. Why did it happen this way? Oh, Lord, where were you here? The Lord is going to make it all clear. And when I see it, when you see it, you're going to say to God, I would not have had you change anything. I am so glad that you directed me this way. I'm so glad that I experienced being homeless. I'm so glad that I knew what it meant to have a car repossessed. Lord, it seemed like you failed me at the time, but now I see what you developed in me through that situation. The Bible says all things work together for the good, but it's unsafe. It's unsafe to step off the path that God has designed. It is unsafe to follow your own way. We can't judge one another because every man's relationship with God is unique and it's distinct and it's dangerous for you to look at somebody and condemn them or put them in heaven because God only knows. But I would tell you tonight that God desires one day to wipe the tears out of your eyes. The psalmist says that there's a special bottle. There's a book where all the tears are placed in this bottle. God said there's a special book that records every reason why you ever cry. God saves each tear. This is how intimate God is. This is how deep his love is for you. The tears, every one, he bottles them and puts them in a book. He can't wait one day, not only to explain why those tears were caused, but also to wipe away the final ones. Because you, like Christ, are going to be sad when you see people that are eternally lost. It's going to break your heart. You're not going to weep over your mother. You're not going to weep over your children. You're going to weep over lost humanity, for there will be no respecter of persons. We must move into a position in our lives where we love everybody the way Christ loves them, where we don't favor those who we grew up with, where we don't favor those who we come through the same line, bloodline, where we don't favor any child except every child. This is Christ. Christ wants to save us, and he promises. He promises that he'll handle every situation, not only now, but he will keep you and save you. As a matter of fact, I love the next verse when he says, No more crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give, I, I will give unto them, unto him that are thirst, the fountain of the, uh, 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 of the water of life freely. When do we get that fountain, brothers and sisters? We must drink tonight. Tonight. If you would open up your heart to God, he will fill you up. If you would give him your mind, he will pour water out freely. He said, I won't charge you. It's paid for. Everything's on the house. I paid for it with my blood. I paid for it with my blood. What will you do with it? What excuse will you make now that God has provided everything for you? What will you do? How will you answer God when he asks you this question? Let me give you one more text. One more text. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 5. One more text. How will you answer God? And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. Before we read it, Isaiah 5, I'm going to give you my answer right now. Before we read it, I'm going to give you my answer. You could say that it's not fair. You could say, hey, we're cheating on the test. But brothers and sisters, my answer is, I never intend to have to answer this question. For if you are asked this question, if you come to a point in your life where you have to answer this question, you're lost. You're lost. The Bible says in Isaiah 5, beginning with verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, judge between me and my people what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it what more could I have done for your life that I have not done what more could God have done what more 
You be the judge. We're going to be able to see. Brothers and sisters, we are told in Philippians that the time will come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But many of those who bow and confess, for them, their confession will be in vain. For they will confess when it's too late. When it's too late. Too late. Too late. The horror that comes over my body even now. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Ooh. Brothers and sisters, this thing is so real. Can you imagine standing in front of God? Admitting that he is God and admitting that he's fair and admitting that he's just and it's too late. Can you imagine looking at Satan, knowing that you've been deceived, acknowledging and Satan trying to get you to take the city and you not even follow him. The time will come when no one will follow him anymore. You will welcome hell fire. Fire is not what you have to worry about. It's that moment of distress when you recognize that I've been bamboozled. I've been deceived. I am lost for nothing. I am lost. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say that we'll do what Adam and Eve did. The woman you gave me, Lord, the serpent you put in the tree, no. Everybody's going to look at themselves, see what God has done for them, and the guilt will lie right where it belongs. You did not now choose. Tonight, choose life and live. Tonight, choose Christ and his victory. Tonight, make a decision. I am going to follow Christ. I'm not going to mimic, I'm not going to imitate any man. I'm going to follow Jesus. I don't care what man does to me. Why? Because Jesus said if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. You want a character without any war. You want to be refined without any fire. Somebody said earlier today, we either go through the refining fire and have our characters purged, or you go through hell fire and be eternally destroyed. Go through the refiner's fire. Because the refiner, when he puts the gold in the fire and the dross starts coming to the top, when the gold gets to the point where it's taking all it can, it can, he pulls it out and cools it, lets a little time go and skims a little bit of that dross off, then back into the fire and back out. And he does that process until he looks down and sees a perfect reflection of himself. That's what Christ wants to see, a perfect reflection of himself. He wants to see that in you. He wants to see it in me. Let's go through the refiner's fire. Stop making excuses. Stop acting as though life is unfair. The only life that was treated unfair was the life of Jesus because he didn't deserve anything. He did it strictly because we deserve it. He did it strictly so that we don't have to go through it. Tonight, I give you Jesus. Tonight, I hand him to you. Not all wounded, broken and bruised. No, 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 no. I give you a high and lifted up Savior. And when sin and all that, 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 that sin is caused is obliterated and destroyed and wiped out from the face of this earth, the only thing that will remain as a result of sin are the wounds on his forehead, the wounds in his hand, the wounds in his feet, and the wounds on his side. That's the only thing that will ever be a reminder. That's it. Brothers and sisters, will you accept that gift tonight? Will you accept eternal life? This is life eternal, that you might know me. That's what Jesus says, not me, the preacher, that you might know Christ. Tonight, I offer him to you. But you have to give something up. You have to give up your heart. You have to give up your own ideas, your murmuring, your complaining. You have to say, Lord, for Christ, I accept eternity. For Christ, tonight, for Christ, I give up everything. The Bible says, whosoever there be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, 
you cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, He says, if you're not willing to give it all up right now, tonight, here's Christ. But you have to give everything up in exchange. Will you do it? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Tonight, what is your decision? What is your choice? Ask God, Lord, cast the unclean powers of darkness that have so long been in my presence away from me tonight. Tonight, I accept you. Tonight, I give you my heart. Tonight, I don't make any excuses. I just ask that you would take it. I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours. God promised, and he will fulfill his promise. The promise is that I have gone to prepare a place for you, and I'm coming again to get you. If God can promise that he prepared a place for us and then promise that he's coming back to get us in between, that means I will keep you until I get back. He can keep you. He can keep you. Tonight, ask him. Say, Lord, covenant to keep me. Covenant now. Don't let my flesh win the fight against heaven. Tonight, tonight, right now, secure my salvation. And whatever I need to go through, Lord, take me through it. Do what needs to be done, but Lord, let me be saved. Let me be a part of the first resurrection. Let me look up and say, this is my God. We have waited for him. Tonight, this must be our decision. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we call upon you not because, not because it's so favorable, but Lord, there's no one else to call on but you. You're our only help. You're the only one that can assist us in receiving eternal life. You're the only one. And tonight, we turn to you. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for surrendering to all the chief theories of Satan. Thank you for making it clear tonight that not only do you desire for us to be saved, but you also will never let anyone burn for thousands and thousands of years because it's a pain. It's your strange act. It's unwanted labor. Please, Lord, pour out your spirit in our individual lives. Bless us tonight. If you want to give your heart to God for the first time, as heads are bowed, eyes are closed, just raise your hand. Father in heaven, note those hands and mark them tonight. Note them and mark them. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.